Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll make a start. Um, I don't know where young Farden is, but I think he's having his eyeball plucked out or something by the looks of his email. Um, given the uh, length and extent of Tom's email, then um, we probably don't need to spend any further time doing parish notices or anything today. So it's straight over to Matt to talk about hyperacute stroke. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming along. Um, my talk today is slightly different to what Tom sort of put in his little trailer. Um, it's more about some of the sort of services we've got available at the moment. And this comes on the back of a few um, sort of adverse events and things we've had recently. Um, and we just thought it would be useful just to update people about things that can be done and things that should be done for, for various different stroke, uh, stroke emergencies. And a lot of these things are things that as general physicians or other doctors in the hospital actually people will get involved with because, as you're probably aware, there isn't a 24-hour, um, seven-day-a-week stroke service in Ninewell. So a lot of the service does rely on input from our colleagues and medical registrars and, and lots of other specialists. And also people, as a few of the cases I'm going to um, use to illustrate this show, you know, stroke, people have strokes in all sorts of parts of the hospital. So actually, everybody being aware of what can be done and therefore activating the right pathways is really, really quite helpful. So I thought it would be useful just to update people on, on what can be done and what should be done. So what I'm going to cover today is um, the inpatient thrombolysis pathway, which does exist. There's been a few people recently who didn't realise this, this exists, so just to update you on that. Um, a little bit about sort of complications and, and things around thrombolysis, because again, particularly for any people on the sort of general medical rotor, may get involved with these patients after thrombolysis, out of hours, because these uh, almost inevitably things happen out of hours when there's less staff around. Um, and then also a few things about uh, malignant middle cerebral artery syndrome, um, which causes raised intracranial pressure. Because again, we've had a few um, adverse events recently where the pathways and things haven't been quite as slick, and people haven't been quite sure what to do. And so I'm going to update you around a little bit around the evidence around some of these areas and also about the pathways and things we have locally. So I'm going to start with the patient's story. Uh, and this is a good news story, so this isn't one of our adverse events. It just shows what can happen if things go well. So it's about five or six months ago now, there's a 52-year-old man who's actually on the renal ward. And he, was, uh, he had IgA nephropathy. He was just um, getting initiated on peritoneal dialysis. Um, <laughs> For, for, his, for his renal failure for that. And unfortunately, while he was in Ward 22, um, he had a stroke. He developed dense right-sided weakness, um, aphasia. Um, and appropriately, the nurses on the, on the ward recognised, oops, something's not right here. This guy might be having a stroke. And dialed 2222, as they're meant to, put out a fast call. Um, and then that patient was assessed really rapidly by the registrar on call. It's one of the... the um, the, uh, on our stroke regis, came along, assessed the patient, said, yep, yeah, looks like this guy's having a stroke. Uh, it's all very acute, not really any contraindications. Discussed with the, with the consultant on call, um, activated the pathway, got a CT scan within about 30 minutes of his onset of symptoms. That was normal, didn't show any um, hemorrhage or anything, any contraindications to thrombolysis, and had his thrombolysis within about 50 minutes of, of symptom onset. Um, he was then transferred up to the, to the stroke unit, as we tend to do for people who have been thrombolysed. Um, and initially, he, you know, he still had dense weaknesses. He um, still quite aphasic, but he had a little bit of little bit of power coming back. He then had quite a long, prolonged course in hospital. Um, so he went back to the renal wards initially because was, she obviously was obviously getting started as peritoneal dialysis, and he's kind of under kind of shared care for a while in the renal uh, in the renal ward. And he had a really quite a rocky rocky early start. Um, he had a number of aspiration pneumonias, he got influenza A, then he got parainfluenza, and I think he got coronavirus as well, so he caught every single respiratory virus under the sun. And that kind of prolonged his initial recovery. You know, it didn't really pick up much for a while, but actually during, um, gradually began to pick up. His swallow came back, we managed to get him off his NG tube. He was transferred to Royal Victoria Hospital under my care, and over the next four, three or four months improved to the point where he went home. He's now walking with a stick, um, he's eating and drinking normally. He's still quite dysphasic expressively, but receptively he's, he's really good and can talk really well. He's actually done really well, and I think there's a few learning points from this. One is that the pathway, when it works really well and really slick, we can deliver these time-critical interventions really, really quickly, as was done in this case. And the other key learning point is the outcome we're looking for with thrombolysis, we shouldn't just say, oh, yeah, we're not looking for an instant reversal of the symptoms within thrombolysis, and that's often the perception, that's what we're trying to do, and therefore if they're not walking after a day, the thrombolysis has failed and it's not worth doing. 
the outcomes we're aiming for, that reduction in dependency, that reduction in um, disability, get three, six months down the line. So often a lot of people who see people acutely think, oh, it's failed, it's not working, thrombolysis is rubbish. Whereas actually, and this is what the trials show, that the benefit is down the line in terms of reducing dependency, and that's why we really need to get, in, get these pathways ways really slick. So here was a real success story about how the inpatient thrombolysis pathway, pathway worked. In terms of the evidence behind thrombolysis, there was a little bit of contrary. It's about three years ago now, um, there's this letter appeared in The Lancet where people started questioning the evidence base behind, behind thrombolysis. It had become, you know, we'd, we'd accepted this was a, a good treatment. It was most places in the UK and around the world have good systems for, for, for delivering it um, to patients. Um, and the, the questions that were raised around this were, um, that were around some of the, the trials involved. So the NINS trial was saying, you know, mainly two centres, um, and they seemed to have a lot better outcome than the other centres, and therefore was the bias in, for some reason in, in those centres. IST3 was an open-label trial, and all the, all the criticisms that come with that as a trial design. Um, ECAS3, they were saying, was very unbalanced, that, there were, that the, the two groups, the treatment group and the control group, um, that there were sort of, seemed to be more high-risk um, patients in the control group. Um, and so their, the conclusion in this letter was actually, they're saying that the evidence is pretty precarious and should we actually be using alteplase? And there's a bit of a panic and, and stuff uh, as a result of this. So the MRHA then went away, um, and they convened an expert working group just to go through all the evidence again in a systematic way, just to re-examine it all to see oh, should we still be offering this as a treatment. Uh, so they looked at all the literature um, and all the various sources of information you, you can see on the slide there. Uh, and they spent about six months going through all this just to sort of review the evidence. And basically concluded that, yes, alteplase does have a benefit. So used up to 4.5 hours after onset of symptoms, um, there is a benefit and that outweighs the risk. Um, it's very time-dependent. Again, this is one of the key things. It's very time-dependent. So the earlier you give it and minimising that that um, onset of symptoms to treatment start is really, really key in, prevent, in, in increasing your, your outcome. And actually, you're saying there's actually more evidence that's come out since that letter saying that actually the, uh, they actually strengthens the previous evidence base behind using alteplase and thrombolysis. So as stroke physicians, we all thought, phew, good, we've been doing the right thing, we've got the evidence, and, and it's, it's been re-evaluated and it's backing us up. Around the same time, there's this um, updated meta-analysis, again, um, a lot of the similar people doing this as, the, as we're doing the, the MRHA review um, that was published in The Lancet. Again, so there's lots of stuff in The Lancet around that time. And this is one of the key graphs, and it's pretty much the similar to you know, previous evidence we've seen about thrombolysis. So on... What turn it doesn't work on them. So basically, this is time on the bottom from time of symptom onset, and this is um, your benefit, your odds ratio of having a, a beneficial outcome. Um, and you can see that, and these, so these are the 95% confidence intervals, and you can see there's benefit up to actually about five hours uh, from the meta-analysis. But again, the key points from this are that the earlier you treat, the better your odds ratio. So you don't want to wait to four and a half, five hours. You want to get in there as early as possible. And the other thing is their main, the primary outcome they're looking here for, for a beneficial outcome is being independent and alive at three to six months. So actually, it's not that instant effect. The outcome we're looking for, the same with the case before, is that sort of benefit down the line. And I think we often forget that when we're, when we're delivering it. Um, there was a, a study a few years ago. It's, it's just interesting psychology. If you say that somebody, you know, if, if treatments are um, beneficial up to a certain amount of time, people ultimately think, oh, we've got that amount of time to deliver it. So people slow down, people relax, they think... Well, I've got at the time is about three hours as the cut off for giving thrombolysis. So this big psychological thing of, oh, we've got three hours, we can do it along, take our time, and there's this big spike of people getting thrombolysis at three hours because people there's this perception that that's how long you've got. Whereas actually, you want to set everything up so you can give it as quickly as possible and delivering. And that's why pathways we have developed are trying to aim to do that. And every part of the pathway is then trying to be really slick to get their imaging, get them assessed, and get the thrombolysis given. The government targets for this around, again, also reflect that. So previously, we had to get, um, the, the target was getting, delivering thrombolysis with, within one hour of people arriving in hospital. This is for outpatients who had strokes in the community. And they've actually tightened that recently, again, to try and drive improvement, so that now that 50% of people have to get thrombolysed within 30 minutes of touching the front door. And that's from coming in in the ambulance to the front door to getting the scan to delivery. So it's quite 
a lot has to happen in that time, so it's quite tight. And then the remaining 80% within, uh, within an hour. So it's just trying to drive this continual improvement to try and deliver things earlier, therefore to deliver the benefit. In terms of the outcome, this is looking at various subgroups. So again, uh, so to the right of this suggests that um, giving alpha plays is better than, than giving um, than the control. And so the, to the left shows it's worse. And you can see, in terms of the treatment delay, again, it supports that thing that giving it earlier, you have a bigger chance of, of having a benefit from it. And again, by the time you get to more than 4.5 hours, it crosses the line of no effect. The other interesting thing is, uh, it's not that recent development now, but relatively recent, is the over 80s benefit. So the license, and I think the license actually still technically is for under 80s, but the IST3 trial specifically went out to look at this question, do over 80s benefit from thrombolysis? And the answer from IST3 and also from this meta-analysis is yes, they do. So we shouldn't be excluding people um, on the basis of age of being over 80. And they, they, they still benefit. And if anything, the suggestion they may, may benefit more than younger patients. Um, this, the NIHS is the um, National Institute of Health uh, Stroke Score. And it's basically a severity score of how severe your stroke symptoms are. So zero is entirely normal, and it goes up to a maximum of 30. So the higher the score, the more severe your stroke is. Uh, and, it, and again, you can see that people are all, however severe their stroke is on the whole, tend to benefit. There's this little bit of an aberration in the middle, where if it's 11 to 15, it's... That's not a stroke call. Um, um, but overall, you know, whatever your NHS, there seems to, does seem to be a, a benefit. The main side effect, and obviously the main concern with thrombolysis, is that of bleeding. This is the one thing that everybody worries about. Either intracranial bleeding um, or GI bleeding are the two main places that, that people bleed. Um, and the things that seem to affect the bleeding is time doesn't actually seem to have that much effect. So time is more of a, an effect on what benefit you're going to get rather than the bleeding risk quite so much. Um, age, again, doesn't seem to affect your, your bleeding. It's pretty similar figures for, for however old you are. Um, and again... Um, it doesn't seem to vary that much or significantly different between how severe your stroke is. Um, but it's, you know, it's inevitable what you're going to give a drug that breaks down clots. You are going to get some people who bleed. But if you, if you pick the people who are going to benefit from it, the benefit, you can choose which you know, the benefit is going to outweigh that risk. And when we're giving cons you know, gaining consent, if we can, from the patient, we do mention bleeding. Um, but obviously, we, if the overall benefit is there, we, we'd like to try and deliver it if we can. In terms of mortality, um, this is, again, looking at alteplase being worse on the right, uh, and sorry, alteplase better on the, on the left, sorry, uh, and this is increased mortality. So there's actually an increased mortality in the first few days, and that's related to the bleeding. So a, a few people who we do thrombolize will have a significant bleed and die as a result of it. However, by the time you get to later on, there's not, that, there's not a significant difference in mortality. So you have an early spike in mortality, and that's at the benefit of saving and having and decreasing mortality and decreasing effects down the line. Um, so the summary from the meta-analysis is that yeah, if you treat within the first three hours, that's when you have substantially more benefit than later treatment. So again, that emphasis, this is an emergency, we need to treat people quickly. And these are the kind of figures that were quoted, and this can be quite helpful when you're talking to, to, to patients or relatives. So... If treated within three hours, about a third of patients will improve to some degree. One in 10 will recover completely, but one in 20 will get worse because of bleeding. But overall, within that time, if you, if you pick the right patients, people, you know, there is an overall, overall benefit. And there's an initial increase in bleeding during that first week, but then that seems to balance out by having overall sort of the, the benefits longer term being a bit better. So we've developed, as I mentioned before, about the inpatient pathway. So this has been developed to try and really minimise that, um, that whole time from symptom onset to delivering and make it as slick as possible and treating it as a medical emergency. Um, so it's a similar sort of way as like we have arrest calls and 2222 calls. Um, so there's been lots of education to lots of nurses on, all around the hospital, on the wards, and we do get lots and lots of calls for, through this pathway. And understandably, not all these patients are going to turn out to be stroke. It's probably better to try and cast a slightly wider net and find people who aren't strokes than, than miss people and, and, and to potentially not give people the treatment that could bring them benefit. So the idea is that people recognise actually this has been a stroke. They do the FAST test, which is a really, that's the face, arm, speech uh, and time test. Um, if that is positive and suggests they have had a stroke, they dial 2222 
and say fast positive and say where it is. That, in hours, at the moment triggers the stroke team, somebody from the stroke team to come running along and assess the patient. To, first of all, to see, you know, is this a stroke uh, or is it just a sort of funny, faint fit kind of thing? If it's a stroke, we then sort of look, you know, are there any major contraindications that this patient wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get thrombolysis? You know, re- recent major surgery um, on warfarin with a, with a high INR, reasons that they wouldn't get thrombolysed. If there's no contraindications and it looks like a stroke and it's within time, um, what we'll then do is put on another 222 call, with this time a brain attack, and this activates the bigger teams. This activates uh, radiology, so it automatically alerts radiology that we've got a patient who's potentially for the thrombolysis so that they can get, be ready and prepared and um, know that this patient's coming to the CT scanner. It activates the stroke nurses who come down with the kit to deliver the thrombolysis, um, and they all then convene at the CT scanner, um, get the CT. If, they are, if it, there's no contraindication on the CT, no bleeding and they've still got symptoms and they're still a, a candidate for thrombolysis, that is then delivered in the CT. So the first bolus is delivered in the CT. And that's slightly different to what happens in Perth where the patient goes to HDU first to get here. In, in nine wells, we give it in the CT anteroom. Again, it's all about minimising that risk. If we, we were waiting for them to go up to the stroke unit, that's going to add another 10, 15 minutes potentially by the time they got up they got into bed. So, so getting, delivering that first bolus means we're really delivering the treatment as soon as we possibly can. We then transfer them up to the stroke unit and, ca- and we'll start the infusion on the way and send them up to the, to the stroke unit. And the whole thing is designed to try and treat this thing as a medical emergency and, and get things done quickly. So things where other people outside the stroke team may be involved. So out of hours, it's the medical registrar. At the moment, it's Med, uh, Medreg A who will get the fast 2222 call. So the idea is they go along quickly and do this a quick assessment. And out of hours, because we haven't got a stroke consultant on call, it's the uh, consultant physician on call who's available, obviously, through switchboards. Um, and they and the liaison with the med reg can help make the decision about whether they should be for, thromb- for thrombolysis. There are some issues with that, and I, I personally think this should be delivered by a stroke specialist in hours and hours, 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, but we, with our current setup, we haven't unfortunately got, got that resource to, um, to do that, although we are working, on, working towards that. The key learning points, again, I'll keep going on about this time is brain, so it's just trying to say that you know, it's really important that we treat these as medical emergencies and get in there as quickly as possible. Um, we've got slick systems in place, and we're trying to do it, and part of me coming here today is to let everybody know about the, the slick systems we should have in place just so that people know how to use them if they should come across a patient who's had a stroke. Um, and say so the key outcome is this outcome at three to six months. So failure to improve in the first you know, few hours doesn't necessarily mean the treatment's failed. What, and often people who are delivering the treatment don't see the benefits down the line. Uh, we have the benefit as stroke doctors of seeing that, and that's what the evidence shows is where the benefit is. The other area where people might become involved in this is if people develop uh, complications. So the common things that can happen, well, they're not common, but things that can happen, uh, are intracranial bleeding, um, extracranial bleeding, that's mainly GI. We've actually diagnosed a few gastric cancers, unfortunately, by we give the thrombolysis, they bleed, investigate that and find they've got a, a gastric cancer. Um, anaphylaxis um, and hypertension isn't really a complication of thrombolysis, but it's something that can happen around acute stroke uh, that can have an implication. Because if you're hypertensive, your risk of bleeding following thrombolysis is much higher. So we like to, if people are very hypertensive, we like to try and, and treat that and keep that under control. So key to recognising these things are um, monitoring and review. So in, in nine wells, say patients go to the, to the stroke unit for this, uh, and the nurses there do the neuroobs and vital signs, and they've got a set protocol um, for following thrombolysis for the, for the times that these get done. We also ask that people are reviewed, particularly people are thrombolised out of hours and then going up to the stroke unit, they're asked to be reviewed by the stroke team um, during hours or reg B out of hours, just to ensure they're stable, ensure they've got everything in place, um, also to request a repeat CT scan for the following day because we, we need to get a repeat follow-up CT the following day. If there's any deterioration in that patient, either their neurological signs or their vital signs to suggest they might be bleeding somewhere or deteriorating from some other cause, um, they'll cause the doc- call the doctor on call again during the hours. That would be the stroke doctor, but out of hours it would be, be Reg B. Um, and again, it's really important we get a speedy review because obviously if these people are going off, they need reviewing quickly because they're essentially level 2 patients and in Perth patients actually go to... Um, medical HDU to, to have this monitoring done. Um, so these are kind of medical emergencies that need sort of, sort of dealing with quickly and assessing quickly. 
So in terms of bleeding, if you come across a patient who's bleeding following thrombolysis, obviously stop the alteplase because you don't want to prolong the bleeding even longer. Alteplase has actually got a really, really short half-life. So when you stop it, it's actually be out of the system pretty quickly within sort of 20, 30 minutes. It's really got a really quite a short half-life. Um, if you suspect they're intracranial bleeding, so they've got new neurology, if they've got a, you know, a rapid deterioration in their neurology suggesting something's gone on in their head, you want to get a repeat urgent CT brain just to see if there is, if, is bleeding there. Again, if you suspect bleeding, we call, um, we've, got, we've got a bleeding protocol up on, on Ward 33. Um, so we call the blood transfusion service, we get two units of cryofibrinogen, and obviously give that if they are bleeding. And the rest of it is just general resuscitation, as you would do for any other bleed. So BP support if they're shocked, if necessary. If they've lost lots of blood, replace that and um, you know, um, cross-match them and, and replace blood if they're bleeding. And if it's an intracranial bleed, it's worth discussing with neurosurgery because there may be something they can do to really, you know, depending on the extent and the site of, of the bleed and the overall clinical picture. I think if, you, if you're getting calls these patients out of hours, it's worth at least a discussion with neurosurgery to see if there's anything they can do from a neurosurgical point of view. Another common, well not, again, not common, but another complication we do see is anaphylaxis. As with any drug, people can have a, an allergic reaction to alteplase. And this is really just general, normal um, anaphylaxis treatment. Again, the key thing is stop the alteplase if that's what's precipitating it. Um, put that 2222 call because um, we have a peri-arrest situation. Again, it's just an ABC assessment as we're all trained to do in ALS. Um, key thing is giving adrenaline, fluid, salbutamol, and antihistamines to try and reverse the anti that um, anaphylactic reaction. And it may be they need, depending on their overall clinical picture, if they would be a candidate for level 2 or level 3 care, considering whether they need to move to HG or depending how well they are ITU. Again, that's obviously going to depend on their comorbidities and background, background health. Um, hypertension. Um, we commonly see this with strokes because it's a normal kind of physiological response. If you have a stroke, you'll often see people's blood pressure going up. It's a sort of, a sort of stress response to try and uh, increase your perfusion and, and, and you, you, know, you have a cortisol surge, etc. But some, And if this is within reason it's not it's actually uh, beneficial there's recent uh, again more updates evidence showing that if you um, treat hypertension unless it's really high in acute stroke you actually have worse outcomes so we don't treat hypertension in acute stroke unless it gets really really quite high so but if it's really high and you thrombolize somebody you have a quite a significant risk of bleeding so if the diastolic blood pressure um, that should be the other way oh, so what's going on here I think I've updated the slide and slightly, slightly screwed it up. That should be cyst uh, to remember that. Diast that should be 100. And, is that, yeah, if your systolic blood pressure is over 180 and your systolic blood pressure is over 100, 105, that's when you treat. So a complete gobbledygook on the slide there. Um, you need to try and treat that and bring that down. So the idea is you give labetalol IV because that acts really, really quickly because you want to try and get this down quickly. Give it over one to two minutes with cardiac monitoring, which we can do in, in the stroke unit, um, and again, see what the blood pressure does. If that doesn't work, you can repeat that, or sometimes you need to double the dose after 10 to 20 minutes, and the maximum dose is 200 milligrams. The alternative, you can give that initial bolus, and then you might need to give an infusion, um, starting initially at 2 milligrams per minute, just to try and get that blood pressure down. Um, into a sort of safer, a sort of safer area to try and reduce that risk of bleeding. But again, if anybody on the med reg rotor might be called to see patients who are hypertensive, and we do have a protocol as part of the thrombolysis protocol of what to do. So you don't need to remember that. It's all and it has, the, has the correct numbers for the blood pressure rather than that slide. So that's kind of around thrombolysis. Um, so the common, the, the pathway, inpatient pathway, and the sort of common complications and problems we see, and how people might be getting getting involved. Any questions about that before I move on to the next part? Alan, sorry. You said if there were morphine that are high, and I was very high, like I'm So, so we, if people are on warfarin, we send off an urgent INR. So being on warfarin itself isn't a conjuring case. You want to know what the INR is. Um, locally, we say if the INR is less than 1.6, Oh, sorry, 1.7, we would give thrombolysis. Above that, it's a bit, uh, if it's above that, we wouldn't, we wouldn't give thrombolysis. You could try and re you know, reverse it, but by the time you've done that, all the time, you know, marching on all the time. So the key thing is if somebody is on warfarin, 
So even in a normal range, we wouldn't give we wouldn't give thrombolysis in that stage. We really want either a normal INR or only mildly elevated. Different places have slightly different thresholds for what INR they would um, see as acceptable as, as giving it. So dual antenna platelets itself isn't yeah we don't is not is not so so we would give thrombolysis with dual antenna platelets. The NOAX a little bit of a difficult and obviously slightly, slightly emerging picture because none of the thrombolysis trials were done really when there were lots of no acts around and people on them. Um, first of all, it's important to work out if the patient's actually taken them, because if the patient actually hasn't taken them for three days, they're essentially not anticoagulated and it would be safe to go thrombolysis. Um, if they, say, hadn't had their they're on um, river oxaban and they hadn't had it for more than 24 hours, again, we would normally give, because essentially the, it'll have kind of worked out the system and they're essentially not anticoagulated. But the times in between, it's a bit of an evidence-free zone at the moment in terms of at what point it becomes safe to... To give to give thrombolysis. Sorry. Well, thanks very much. Any other questions before we move on? Um, so we're going to move on to a slightly different topic now, but another sort of acute thing. That's not the acute stroke team on a bad day or a good day. They've all got too much hair to be me for a start. Um, so this, this is kind of loose with reference to Queen and under pressure and um, raising to cranial pressure. So there's a thing called malignant MCA syndrome. It's actually it's a bit of a bad name for it because it's not really malignant at all because then people start thinking of cancers automatically. But it's more malignant process in terms of a, a sort of rapidly developing, growing process rather than actually being a malignancy as such. And it's basically what you get in, because our, our, box is a, our, our head is a, a sealed box, so if you get a you know, significant-sized infarct, that infarcted tissue then swells, you get edema, and that's what we see on CT scans when we see a stroke, it's actually edema within the tissue. If you've got a significant area that becomes edematous and swells up, you again set off this vicious cycle. So you get the edema, the edema causes raised intracranial pressure because you've got within a fixed area and it's just swelling up. If that's significant enough, that pressure within the skull can then overcome the perfusion pressure from your blood pressure, so then you're not perfusing your brain because the blood can't get into the skull because of the increased pressure, which then causes further tissue ischemia because you're not getting that blood supply in, 
which causes further infarcted tissue, and it sets off this vicious cycle of just getting this increased um, pressure, and eventually the edema will cause herniation as the pressure builds up and the edema builds up in the brain. Um, and so we need to, first of all, need to recognise this as potentially going to happen. We then need to recognise if people are developing this and then use, again, appropriate pathways to, to get people treated appropriately. Um, and we've been, again, we've had a couple of layers recently, some that have gone, and other few instances where this has gone really, really well and people have had good outcomes from this being recognised and treated, and other, and other areas where it's not gone quite so well and people have had bad outcomes because it, the whole pathways has just been a little bit wishy-washy. So we've reviewed our whole pathway, we've been working with our colleagues in um, neurosurgery um, and um, trying to work on how we can sort of recognise this a little bit better. So this is um, a CT scan of a patient. It's about four, this is when I was a registrar. This is about four or five years ago. It was a relatively young guy. and it, it tends to be younger people that are more at risk because they tend to have less brain atrophy and therefore you've got less space to compensate in your, in your brain. Um, your older people can get it, um, but it tends to be younger people that are more at risk. So this is a guy who presented with an acute stroke. And I don't know if it projects particularly well. You can see his middle cerebral artery on the right-hand side there. So that's his left middle cerebral artery, and that's his right and you can see on the right, it's quite a bit denser. So that's a big clot sat in his right middle cerebral artery, and it's quite proximal. So from the outset, we kind of recognised this guy's got a big area of brain um, threatened. And from memory, I don't think this was his post he, he was thrombolysed, and this was his post thrombolysis scan. So he still had a big clot sat there despite thrombolysis. So we recognised actually this guy's kind of got a really proximal clot. It's a really high risk of infarcting you know, a massive area of his brain just because of where the clot's sitting. And he's also quite young and doesn't have much atrophy, so he hasn't got much space to compensate. And that's just a, a, a slide of the source uh, higher up. So he went up to the stroke unit. He was being monitored. And by next morning, he was becoming much more drowsy. He was sleepy. He was, his weakness had got worse on, the, on, his, uh, on his left side and really wasn't responding. And this was picked up um, by the nurses by doing their neurobs when he came up. So we saw him next morning. We got a repeat scan. And this was his repeat scan that following day. So things have progressed. The strokes now become a lot more obvious. You can see this is a lot darker. So this is an infarcted area of brain. And you can also see he's, obliter you know, he's having lots of mass effects. So he's obliterated his ventricles on that, on that right-hand side. It doesn't project quite so well, but he's also got some midline shifts. So he's beginning to push um, you know, the, the swollen right side of the brain. is beginning to push into the left. And this is what, you know, why it's deteriorated clinically. And if that's just left to progress, that's just going to get worse and worse to the point where he herniates and dies. And so we discussed with the neurosurgeons and they took him away because there's only really one treatment which is shown to improve, uh, to, to stop people like this, this dying. We'll talk about again the, the evidence base and what the aims of this treatment are in a minute. He went for um, a hemicraniectomy. So this is basically where they physically re relieve the pressure by going in, cutting a part of the skull away over that part of the dermatous uh, brain to let the pressure out. So basically that bit of brain swells out of the way rather than in the way. So this is post-op. And you can see he's got a big bit of his skull missing and all this tissue here. It's actually it's essentially dead brain tissue because it's the, it's the stroke. It's kind of flopping out of his head. Um, that's a bit more of a dramatic picture. And again, you can see all this pressure, but the midline's gone back to the normal. And it's basically relieved that, that vicious cycle and it's protect, trying to protect this part of the brain which hasn't been affected by the stroke. Um, so, so this is the only really evidence-based treatment we've got for situations like this and the most recent Royal College guidelines which came out last year for stroke um, involved these uh, covers this in quite a lot of detail so there's been a few more trials again recently sort of backing up the evidence base behind it so they're saying that anybody with a an MCA artery infarction um, who meets these criteria below um, should be considered for hemicrani uh, hemicraniectomy and they should be referred again within 24 hours of stroke and treated within 48 hours so again it's a really acute thing if you wait too long you miss that window of opportunity and it can be quite a narrow window of opportunity as one of the um, the bad outcomes we saw where it happened overnight and the pathways just weren't slick for getting treated he can't the patient basically missed that whole window of opportunity to to get treated um, because of, of delays in, in recognition and treatment so people who benefit if you've got a modified ranking score of less than two so that basically means that you're not significantly disabled beforehand um, that you've got Deficits indicating that you've had an infarct um, where you see that, that, um, that stroke. Um, that you've got quite a severe stroke, so more than 15. Again, that's just suggesting you've got a bigger infarct area and therefore more likely to have, have an MCA. 
that your conscious level has decreased. Um, part of the NIHSS I talked about before has a thing about conscious level. So again, if you decrease your conscious level, and if you've got signs on a CT of a big area of infarct, um, or again, if you're using MRI, um, a significant area of infarct. So these people should be considered for it. And the evidence behind this uh, comes from a number of trials. So this is a, a meta-analysis. Well, it's not, it's not a massive number of trials, but enough trials to show significant benefit. So this is looking... Initially, most of the trials are done in under 65-year-olds. I'm not quite sure why they chose 65 as a cut-off. And these are three trials which were done in under 65-year-olds. And this is looking at the... Um, to the left is benefiting from the surgery, and to the right is benefiting from the conservative management. And all three of the trials individually, but also in the meta-analysis, um, showed um, benefit for surgery. But it's really important to let you know what the benefit is we're trying to achieve. So that person has had that stroke, and that part of the brain where they had the stroke is essentially dead, and they're going to have a deficit from that stroke. So the aim of the surgery isn't to try and reduce their stroke severity, it's purely a life-saving procedure to stop them dying from their stroke. And that's what we have to do when we're consenting patients and explain that to either patients or the family, that the purpose of this, they, will, they are still going to be left with a stroke, the big stroke they've had. But if we don't do anything, they will die. If we do do something, they won't die. And that's where a lot of this comes down to quality of life. And that's why it's, it's really important for these patients we consent them with the, with the patient, if possible, and, or try and consent them when we know they're at risk, or with family, because we don't want people to go away thinking, we're going to do this, and their stroke's going to get better, and they're going to be completely fine. But some people might say, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to survive with a big stroke, I'd rather die. Other people, and some say, I'm, for whatever reason, I, you know, if, if it's going to save my life, but I'm still left with a big stroke, I would, I'd like to survive. So that's, we, we really have to be honest with patients when we're consenting them what the aim of the surgery is. Um, this is looking at um, this is looking at sorry this one is again also this is um, looking at um, again um, disability so again this is, this is again just goes to show that the, the aim is preventing death rather than disability so the line just kind of crosses the line in terms of, it's not quite significant. It suggests there might be a trend towards reducing disability, but it's not significantly significant to say this, you know, it's, a, it's, it's going to reduce your risk of disability. Then it comes on to the group of the slightly older patients. Um, so it wasn't clear whether older patients would benefit from this as well, and previous guidelines said that it should limit it to under 61s because that's where the evidence was. So research went out and did this trial, Destiny 2, to look specifically at people over 61, and the median age in this trial was 70. And again, they showed benefit in this group. So the odds ratio of, having, um, of surviving um, was significantly higher in those patients who had a hemicraniectomy than those who didn't. And the difference resulted in lower mortality. So people, again, were still significantly disabled from their original stroke, but they survived. And again, that comes back to that key point of when you're consenting patients, explaining exactly what the aim of what you're trying to do is. This is just visually showing that thing at six months and 12 months. Um, so this is people who didn't have hemicraniectomy, and this is people who did. And you can see significantly um, more people in the control group. A modified ranking score of six shows you're dead. Um, it's because you're very disabled. Um, so if you have, if you get the hemicraniectomy, you have, you have a much lower rate of, of dying, but you know, still, still a significant number of people are disabled. So that's why it all comes down to quality of life, and that's why we need to really con discuss that with patients. Um, so that's basically what I've said. The key point is it's, it's, about, it's about saving a life, not about disability. Um, and all age groups seem to benefit. It's previously been restricted. And locally, we're having ongoing discussions with neurosurgeons about older patients because they would still only treat younger patients locally. So we've come up, following a few of the adverse events, we've had this discussion with neurosurgeons and come up with a pathway because we recognised, again, we need to be really slick at recognising these people at risk and getting them referred quick enough to them, to them to be able to get the surgery. And the other thing we found from experience was that if you wait to consent people... Or, you know, or discuss this with them at the time when they actually need it, when they're unwell. They've gone past that point and you can't discuss them because they're drowsy and unconscious. So what we've now said, actually, if we recognise these people are at risk because of their initial presentation, a big stroke, they're at risk of developing, we now have that chat early on with the patient to say, look, there's a significant risk, this will get worse, you could get increased pressure, 
that untreated that will die and discuss at that point if them and their family are able to still discuss that you know if this happens would you want us to do an operation or consider you for an operation um, based on the fact you will still have the big stroke and be disabled but it allows you then to, for them to have a properly informed discussion uh, not at a crisis time when they're able often to try and still have that discussion and then you can sort of document that so when it's out of hours which almost inevitably happens these deterioration happen out of hours you know actually this discussion has been had they would want this or they wouldn't want this so you know, you, you know which pathway you're going down um, so the one, first part of the pathway is recognising people at risk and discussing with them to say, actually, would you want to consider this if this happens? We then also refer to the neurosurgeons at that point, not because we want them necessarily to do anything, but it's more to put it on their radar so that when they get called at three in the morning, they already know about the patient, they know the background, they know it's been discussed by somebody who's experienced in this in terms of stroke physician and that the stroke physician thinks this is appropriate or otherwise, uh, rather than being left to poor Red J overnight to, to make that decision. Um, so they're aware of it and they can put them on their radar so that then if they do become unwell they go on to the next part of the pathway and that's picked up in the stroke unit we can then say actually everybody knows about this the patient would be up for it we can discuss with neurosurgery and everything hopefully then happens in a little bit more of a slick way and they get their surgery quicker um, again these are just sort of the, the, the pre-surgery things that the, the surgeons would do so again that pathway has come out of past experience where things didn't go quite so well where you got to the point where you couldn't discuss it with patients or that they weren't recognised and people weren't getting assessed in, a, in good enough time or discussed with neurosurgery. So I'm going to finish with a, a good story from one of these patients who did really well because I don't want to be end on a down that things don't always work. So we had a lady, it must be about six months ago now, she came in and had a, she'd been found at home. She had a massive stroke. Uh, her husband was away on business, so she'd had a stroke while he was away was actually saved by her dogs because her dogs were barking at 11 o'clock at night and the neighbours thought it was a bit odd, went round and found she'd had a big stroke and she's lying on the ground. So she came into hospital. Um, she wasn't thrombolised because it was an unknown time of onset and when she had a CT when she came in, it was actually already quite an established infarct, so she'd missed that, that window because she'd been on her own at home. But had a significant infarct affecting her non-dominant hemisphere, so she was still able to speak, she wasn't dysphagic, she was still alert, she could talk, but had a dense... Um, uh, left-sided weakness and uh, neglect on that side. But we recognise her case, she's at real risk here of developing this malignant MCA syndrome. So I had a chat with her when she was still in AMU to explain this risk and explain if, if you did get unwell, would you want to do it? And she said, I would. And I also spoke to her husband who was stuck on business in, in Dubai or somewhere and explained the situation to him and he agreed that she would, that's in keeping what she would say, she would want to, to try everything and, rec and accepted that she would still be left with a big stroke. So she went up to the stroke unit and everything went well for, for the first sort of 24 hours or so. And then it was overnight, the following night, she suddenly really quite rapidly went off. So again, it shows how quickly things can happen. Her neurobs and everything were fine one hour. When they were checked an hour later, she was pretty much unresponsive. This pathway kicked into place. We discussed with neurosurgeons already. And she was in theatre sort of a few hours later, having the hemicraniectomy. Um, she then came back to the stroke unit after a short stay in neurosurgery had a period of time in the stroke unit and then stepped down to the brain injury. And so I went down, she was from Fife, so I went to the George Sharp unit in Fife and had a, a, few, week, a, a few months of, of rehab there. And she's now back in New Zealand with her family. She, she, uh, the conscious level recovered really quite quickly. She was able to talk. Um, she still had a weakness down that side, but she's, you know, and she's still very disabled, but she's now with a family in New Zealand alive. And is, in retrospect, she said she was glad that she had this done because she's having this time with her family despite being you know, quite, quite found disabled. So it's just a lesson to us that it's hard for us to judge what people's quality of life is and actually we need to let them make that decision um, for them because what we might think is a rubbish quality of life, other people will think I'm, as long as I'm alive I'm quite happy with that. So she went away smiling, she, she um, Facebooked just pictures in the airport going through Heathrow Airport as she flew out to New Zealand and is obviously really quite glad that we, we did this. So just a bit of a a success story to, to end the talk. So key things from today's uh, talk, uh, from, from the malignant uh, MCA stuff, is actually recognising those at risk, early involvement of neurosurgery so they're aware of them, kind of pre-consenting the patient so we know what their views are, regular neuroobs to pick up the deterioration, and if they do, do, do deteriorate, it's that rapid assessment again, so not thinking, oh, I can leave it for two or three hours and I'll pop up and see is treating it as an emergency on the ward and getting them quickly referred to neurosurgery for the intervention as quickly as possible. 
and that's all for today any questions about that or anything else or anything else acute stroke wise while while we're here Gavin Yeah, so Angie Miller, who's one of the improvement leads, is going, doing another cycle of education around this. He's probably aware with the, all the you know, with nursing changes and lots of wards. It's, it, it needs that rolling programme so that people are kept updated. We're also finding new areas. I was in theatre recovery yesterday seeing a patient, and they never actually I didn't even know this pathway existed. So there are, we are identifying gaps all the time. And also where new nurses have come in and, and new ward staff. And because each individual ward is probably only going to see this quite infrequently, um, they're not going to see it often, so that it's it's it's, it's always going to be a challenge to get people to slick. You know, that people have arrests, you know, cardiac arrest calls a lot more often, but they're not necessarily each individual ward and each ward team isn't going to see strokes that often. So it's kind of it's it's always going to be difficult to keep people keep that awareness up of the of the pathway. But Angie is going to start another another round of education. Paul, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. The top, and most of the ones, I mean, most of the people who present within the time do actually seem, get to see. So, if they, if they present within a, a thrombolizable time, on the whole, do tend to get imaging within time. So, so the ones who don't, I was, hours, but yeah, hours, yeah, um, yeah. They're, they're the patients that are at risk of this. Of the MCA, yeah. So, get, not necessarily mm -hmm. using them to, yeah, that. yeah. Um, yeah. So, it's a good point because I think there's a few there's a few reasons that there's um because the the imaging of acute stroke patients um again should be should be done urgently you know whatever time you know even if they're not thrombolized well there's lots of things there's a, there's a historical background to this that in the past there wasn't a great deal you could do for acute stroke but there's now evidence if you had a bleed for example as a primary bleed if you treat blood pressure aggressively early on you improve outcomes if you have yeah, patients like this, if you recognise they're at risk of malignant MCA syndrome, you can, we can activate this kind of pathway to do it. So there's lots of benefits in doing it earlier. I think part of the problem is, is that development of a culture around targets. So the target in Scotland for a few years now has been to get a CT scan within 24 hours of admission to hospital, which is actually quite a loose target, what we should be doing. And so that means people aim for, oh, we can do it within 24 hours, we can wait for 23 and a half hours, that whole psychology I was talking about before. You can wait to 23 and a half hours, that's fine, because that's within the target. Whereas actually what we should be doing is doing it as soon as possible. And lots of hospitals now are gearing up to do that. The people, if they're coming with a stroke, they get it on the way from the front door to a stroke ward. And that's really what we should be aiming for, because there is stuff you can do in lots of stroke situations. And so it is going to alter management. There's that perception it's not going to alter management, but actually it will in quite a lot of situations now. You wouldn't come in with chest pain and say, oh, we've got 24 hours to get a, an ECG, we'll just leave it for 24 hours. And it should be the same with a stroke. You come in with a stroke, you should get your CT really early on so you know what's going on. You can get the patient in the right place, you can rule out other pathology, you know, they've got brain mets, so to make sure they don't end up in the, in the wrong place, the part of the hospital. But also if there are complications of acute stroke, you can treat those acutely and appropriately. Miles? So, so clot retrieval, there's now an overwhelming evidence base that it's beneficial. So clot retrieval, it, we're, kind of, we're sort of 10, maybe 15 years behind cardiology and stroke, and that we've now realised that actually going in and physically taking out the clot is even better than thrombolysis. And there's, there's the number of trials now that show benefit with really small numbers needed to treat, sort of eight or nine patients um, treated to, to benefit. So it's really, really, really good evidence. The problem we, are, we have now is in terms of having the service to develop that. So in Scotland, well, in the UK generally, we're behind the rest of Europe. 
in Scotland, we're behind the rest of the UK, and in Dundee, we're well behind the rest of Scotland, unfortunately. And part of that is you getting getting the slick systems here for, you know, for even recognising the acute patient having stroke specialists able to make those assessments at the beginning, but also at the moment there are only two people in the whole of Scotland who can actually do thrombectomy, and they're both based in Edinburgh. So we have, we have had, I think, four patients now who've been for thrombectomy, um, but it's on a very ad hoc basis. So if it happens to be Monday to Friday, 9 till 3, so as, as in we can get people to Edinburgh before 5 o'clock, and their cath lab is free, and one of the two people who can do it happens to be free and not doing something else or on holiday. Um, they will take them. They're actually really, really supportive. So we've sent a few people through, and they've actually had really good outcomes. One we had with a massive um, proximal clot that actually went home from Edinburgh and never even came back to us because their symptoms completely resolved once they took the clot out. Uh, another came back with a very mild weakness and, and did really well. So there's a big challenge across the UK and across Scotland about how we set up the service. So the evidence at the moment is that people get thrombolised first and then go straight for, for thrombectomy if it's in a, a sort of a proximal clot on the, in the MCA. In England, they've actually now... Well, they say they've got a strategy. I'm not sure how much they have a strategy. A bit of a political statement that they have a strategy um, to, to train people up and deliver this as a comprehensive service. And what's probably going to happen is they're going to have certain centres where people go initially to get that done, although in England, there's going to, I think, it's going to be more centres. In Scotland, there's a working group working on it, and they had a meeting a couple of weeks ago and the plan initially, I think, is to concentrate on building from the nucleus in Edinburgh and build up a proper service there, and then I'd hope then spread to other centres. But it's kind of getting that critical mass of enough people to do it to then be able to train other people. Um, so I think it's going to be a few years, unfortunately, before we're able to deliver that, and, but at the moment it's quite an ad hoc service. But I think we should still set things up locally, not to, to, let, to deliver it, but we need to still have that recognition that when people come in, that these people might be candidates and therefore have the systems in place to be able to refer them onto it, which we're even a long way off even having that yet to, to assess the people in the first place to go for it. So at the weekend, again, that's, there's a gap in the service at the weekend. So it... it, it and I think from the, the neurosurgeons want that to be a, a, a specialist-delivered, understandably a specialist-delivered conversation. So I think, unfortunately, with the current service setup, we have to accept that patients at the weekend aren't going to have that. And we can debate the rights and wrongs of that and the and things. It's, it's, I think with the current... The neurosurgeons... If it's worth, I suppose it's worth a discussion with the neurosurgeons. They'll often, I think, will say, unless there's, stroke, unless there's a stroke physician involved in that decision, because I think the key thing wasn't necessarily that discussion, but it's having a stroke physician involved in that discussion with them as, as well as anything in terms of is this appropriate in the grand scheme of things of everything else going on. Not to say that you know, if a general physician on call is happy to have that conversation with neurosurgeons or it's worth it, but I think there may be some resistance from understandably from you know from from the neurosurgeons. Fair enough. Yeah, so they they, t they tend to about sort of three or four months later um, go back and they tend to put sort of plastic prostheses in. Now they used to take the bit of bone and put it in the peritoneum and kind of keep it as a little pocket in the peritoneum. Whereas they now tend to chuck it away and put in a, a plastic prosthesis. But it's, it's normally sort of about four months later before they do that because all that swelling has to go down to then. So in the meantime, it looks really weird because they have this bit of skin with all this brain kind of flopping about on the side. Are those people generally still in rehab? Yeah. Yeah, so generally because of the extent of the stroke and initially that caused it, most people, the, the, the people we've had, um, two or three people we've had who've had them, tend to be in rehab throughout that time, so they don't tend to be at, at home when they've still got that, um, that open. The first patient actually we had, they did, they, they had like a sort of crash helmet kind of thing, but the second patient we have, they didn't advise doing that. And I think partly because the, the bit of brain under where it is is actually the stroke brain that's kind of damaged anyway, so actually hitting that bit of the brain is... is probably not going to cause much damage because it's, it's kind of scarred up anyway. It sounds a bit... <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's been, there's been different practice on the two patients we've had from, from the neurosurgeons. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you.